Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to give a presentation on what's been going on recently in the PRA, um, uh, bring up a couple of topics, and then look we'll forward for questions. So uh, since we're already uh, busy past the hour already, and we want to keep it a, a, a reasonably timely meeting, let's get started. We're going to be done. Probably about an hour. So if I could have anything to do with it. We might go to 715, I can try for 7. Thank you. All right, uh, presented by me. Uh, if you're not familiar with me, my name is Connor. I'm Victor Nancy. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, for the next, uh, uh, what, about 46 minutes, fans, uh, the vice president of the uh, PRA. So we have uh, the uh, board meeting, and we uh, realigned our annual officers We'll see what the outcome of uh, that, that is, and if I'll be DP again or something else or what have you. Um, what we're going to talk about is uh, some of the recent accomplishments of uh, the uh, PRA uh, as a chief. Uh, one of the things that the PRA has a difficult time is basically letting people know what we are doing and what we are doing. So one of the ways to attempt to communicate, communicate that, uh, communicate that is here and now talking to you guys and you guys uh, can if you wish share that with other members and non-members and, and the like. Uh, so first uh, we uh, have a, a PRA ground school. Uh, this is an online ground school. We've got uh, over 60 graduated students now. Um, the idea behind the ground school is as you're probably aware um, our sport uh, has some difficulty with regional instructors. Um, there, this is a week that goes by to the PRA office, and many of us uh, don't get questions and calls uh, from people all over the United States and outside of the United States saying, I want to learn to fly a gyro, and I want to know where the instructor is in my town. <laughs> At which point, we then tell them their instructor is a mere three or four hours drive away if they're lucky, and well, that's sort of the chicken and the egg system. So um, we can't put flight instructors uh, uh, remotely everywhere, but we can take a step closer and we can put a ground instructor everywhere. And by putting a ground instructor on the internet and being able to run an internet live instructor led ground school, we can get people started. And also that helps reduce the cost and time and makes more things more efficient in order to get your uh, private pilot, or sorry, your sport pilot or private pilot license that you're going for. Uh, we train for sport pilot, although we have some students that are actually going for private. There's a lot of overlap in it too. Um, the, the study I usually quote is now a few years old, but um, students are 80% more likely to finish their certification if they passed their written knowledge exam during the flight training. So it is a, a huge performance benefit in getting people through their written exam uh, before or during their flight training. Uh, we offer 24 hours of instruction. That's probably going to end up being increased because as we go through class after class, we keep finding that there's lots more that we want to talk about, much more that the students want to get out of the class. So um, we have to keep bumping up the amount of classes and the amount of times so that's probably going to be increasing. Also, we ran into a bit of a problem, a good problem in the way last year. We had to turn away over seven students because we didn't have the software license to be able to allow them to attend the class. So to bump up to the next software license, the software we're using would cost over a thousand dollars, and it was too late to make it all work out uh, by the time we had the last minute registrations. So we're looking at trying to do that. And the problem is, is that the way the software licensing works, there's a cutoff point where we have to know how many students we're going to have, and if we spend the money for the license and then we lose money, then we've got a problem too. So we're going to be kind of working through that with the. Uh, ground school. Um, 
There's a few gaps. Okay, who's the instructor for this? Uh, he is. Thank you. Uh, and also, I'd just like to suggest, and I know you try to do it, if you can have room for the other instructors, our friend instructors, that want to monitor it and get consistency among us, and probably give you some feedback. Yeah, and, and that's how actually I was set up to do that until we ran out of seats. To our students. So, but yeah, uh, um, and we're, we're going to try and do that uh, next time by trying to get a bigger uh, uh, license. So. Yes? What was the past pay ratio? Well, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Okay. Everybody I talk to said that you were really doing a very nice job. I would say that. Well, I, I also, they don't have to get their endorsement from me. They can get their endorsement after taking class from any ground or flight instructor. So I, I don't even know that. Either. I think it's okay that I say that every single person that I've endorsed that's taken the exam has passed. And everyone that's given me their score has been in the high ranks. Wow. Good job. So, but I don't have numbers in hand. Um, you attended the school. Do you have anything that you'd like to show? It's a good experience for you. It's a great experience. Uh, I would like to see refreshers that you could jump into. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a tape record or, you know, Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then review those year after year because the information is so good that you go a period of time and you forget it. Because. Yeah. Um, if this continues to grow, I don't see that being a problem. Uh, we've tried to record the classes. Um, the first software we had was very good at recording stuff, but then we had some, you know, some uh, failures in the recording process. Because, uh, the second software we had didn't fail, but it didn't record the video portion. So if you only have the audio and the slides, you don't get all the instruction because we have a live video feed where we're working with, you know, basically drawing on the screen for diagrams and, and uh, you know, the charts and the calculators and, and the uh, uh, sectionals and stuff like that. So it was kind of useless without that third feed, which the new software can handle. But yeah, if this continues to grow, I believe we'll be able to do that. Uh, and we've also had some requests for people coming back in and taking some of the practice tests that we do. Again, I've tried to provide that at least for a few, um, a month or so after the, the grounds. Yes? Uh, what kind of uh, computer access to the internet? Um, the uh, requirements for last year's software, which may or may not be next year's software, is a software called GoToMeeting. And it supports uh, iPads, it supports Windows PCs, it supports Macintoshes. <coughs> you need what's, what's considered a, it's not a technical term. It's a broadband internet connection, which isn't really a technical term. So a DSL cable. Um, you might be okay with some of the lesser sort of broadband connections, but you have to try it to be sure. And that, that, that's another problem too, is if you get you know, halfway through the first lesson, you need to back out. You can't refund the money because we already spent it on the software license. But uh, if you have a, what's considered a broadband connection, you should have no problem. Dial-up won't work. Dial-up won't work. Are you still on dial-up? <laughs> you're using bear skins and stone knives when you're doing that? You know, that dial up here is? <laughs> Just take a chance. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. The schedule that we have been doing is uh, Thursday evenings. So it's there for three or four hours Thursday evenings uh, for uh, a, a number of weeks. So and then uh, uh, we did have uh, one uh, where we had to reschedule one of them, and sometimes we work around the whole day. Yeah. The other thing you did mention is uh, uh, you can ask questions at the student. It's uh, uh, interact. Interact. Yeah. Yeah. I, in case you guys don't know what I do for a living, my day job is, is I teach um, computer network engineering and security. Um, and, and I have remote students as well. And because of that, I'm certified as an adult learning instructor. And I have to retest on that constantly. So I'm always up on the latest scientific literature on teaching adults. Um, and if you watch a videotape or you take an interactive computer program, your retention is significantly lower than if you 
have a live instructor working with you. So I really wouldn't want to do it any other way. Really study <laughs> signing off. Okay. All right. Good questions. FAA partnership agreement. Um, the uh, one of the most popular or most desired aspects of, of the uh, PRA as an organization uh, is to be able to protect our sport. And we're a pretty small sport when it comes to the other sections of, of uh, aircraft and, and pilot types. Uh, we're the smallest piece of the pie, really. And so uh, we need all the help we can get talking and communicating with the FAA. So we were able to make an agreement and become a fast team industry member. And this gives us uh, a written contract where the FAA is required to communicate and share with us information, and we're required to communicate and share information with the FAA. And it's a, it's a written agreement, and uh, we have meetings at uh, certain times during the year, and uh, we basically uh, share stuff. Uh, the principal topic for everything that we share back and forth is safety oriented. And uh, under this agreement, we have to provide information and materials about like sport rotorcraft and sport rotorcraft and personal rotorcraft to the FAA to help them make safety decisions and safety presentations. They in turn have to tell us what they're willing to provide us to help with training materials and, and education uh, nationwide on those topics. Uh, and as we'll mention in just a minute, we've already uh, done that once. <coughs> we've already uh, completed the, this process. It's a bit of a long, drawn-out process, but we, uh, we've uh, already made good on, on uh, both sides of this. So, any questions about the FAA partnership agreement? Yes. Yeah. Who is our interface with them? Oh, I'm very bad with names, so you can email me and I can send it to you. But it's actually a board. It's a, it's a collection of people that are part of the FAA FAST team. It's the, it's the FAST team uh, industry direct members. Uh, I believe the FAST team website actually lists them somewhere. They have the, the effort to make it through the FAA website and get to it. Who's our PRA interface? That's me. Thank you. <laughs> presentation programs. Um, you have uh, anyone who's experienced uh, pilot, um, especially instructors, but you don't have to be an instructor, uh, can become uh, a, a WINGS presenter. Uh, WINGS FAA Safety Rep Volunteer is the official title. Um, and uh, there are uh, several of us, but there's only about uh, currently actively that I'm aware of, at least according to the FAA database, three in the whole country. Uh, and uh, uh, under that program, we're able to create presentations. And if it goes through the approval process, along with the agreement on the last slide we just talked about, those presentations then become available to all of the safety reps nationwide, of which there are a couple of hundred. And those safety reps are required to give at least two presentations a year, safety presentations, uh, to groups online, EAA chapters, AOPA chapters, or other groups of, of pilots or, or airport personnel or people related to mechanics uh, to uh, aviation and aviation safety. So uh, we created a, um, a uh, uh, presentation. It's been approved and it's now been sent out and available to any WINGS rep in the country that wishes to give that presentation. And it's the only presentation that has topics that include um, light sport rotorcraft um, as well as uh, light sport uh, uh, power parachutes. And uh, that was created by the uh, uh, PRA, and it's, it, it's the only presentation of its kind currently available. And it's being given by other reps to pilots outside of us. So it's, it's telling people about how to deal with light sport rotorcraft uh, and other aircraft in the pattern at non-tower airports and, and other things specific to dealing with uh, light sport aircraft. Any questions about that? All right. How many people here attended um, last year, or was it the year before, year before last's um, seminar on radio use of the pattern? Okay, you guys, that was the that was used as the template to create that book. Right? So how many of us got their log books? How many what? 
How many had their seminar law? Yeah. I didn't know you were supposed to do that. Yeah, that counts as that can count as ground school credit. That's the it would have expired now, right? Oh, that's right. The wings credit expires. Yeah, and you get wings credits for this, so if you're familiar with the wings program. Yeah, it did sign my law Okay. We're going to buy any of this. I'm buy any of this. Yes, it's a system of funding. The artist formally knows it. Uh, DAR support. Um, chapter 26 uh, uh, came to us with the idea to do a promotion to raise donations and funds to support uh, um, uh, DARs. Um, the problem, or one of the issues with us, just like not having enough instructors, is not having enough uh, representatives to uh, make new pilots, to give check rides and sign off and, and give new pilots. Um, we're in a situation where the um, uh, uh, no, actually, it's not DAR. Right? So it's DPE. DPE, I'm sorry. Right. But I'll take the money. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's my head. Right. It's DPE, this game, not a table. My apologies. It's, that's not quite nice. I work on this one. So the DPE program, this game, pilot examiner. Um, the most popular one is Ron Menzies because he's one of the few that are actually active making new pilots. And again, every week or so I get a call from saying, hey, I want to know where to go to take a test to become a pilot. What do I have to tell them? Go to Arkansas. So um, Chapter 26 got the idea we, we uh, partnered with Chapter 26 to raise some money to try and send some uh, certified flight instructors and help them and encourage them uh, to become an ATP. Uh, and um, we did raise some money, and we have that money now in a PayPal account. Now you may ask yourself, well, CFIs, don't they charge for their services? Uh, shouldn't they be doing this because it's going to help their business out? Well, to become a, uh, an examiner, you have to take a minimum of two weeks off your work where you won't be training any students, travel to the FAA, pay to take a class, and at the end of the class is absolutely no guarantee that you will end up being an examiner. So there's a huge financial risk with that, and just that financial risk alone is enough to convince a lot of CMIs that they don't want to do that. So the idea behind this is to attempt to encourage some of the CMIs that will offset their expenses if they attempt to get the this program. Now, there's been another pitch to this program, and that's where the second bullet point comes in. Uh, here are currently evaluating further actions. Um, they haven't been making any more examiners for a lot. And when talking with some of the people in the FAA involved with this program, they're saying it's due to the bizarre budget situation we have going on with the US government right now. And they're not, they don't have any plans on the books yet. Yeah, I mean, before all that came up, uh, the officials have said they have to justify the expense of assigning somebody to a DPE. And the uh, numbers I heard is they need to see in their fiscal around 25 check rides a year. And uh, they don't see that happening. That's actually changed. There is a bit, there's now a process for going right around the FISDO to national. Good. Without having to do with the FISDO at all. Zip zero. No, the sport pilot group is looking for sport pilot DPs and they're they will take some applications. Yeah. yeah, and that's and we, we, we are trying to do, we're actually more interested in doing the sport pilot yeah. route simply because of the speed and efficiency theoretically of doing that. And that's not going anywhere else. So we've kind of got a question here. Um, do we attempt to make a case where we leverage safety pilots not getting their certifications because we don't have enough examiners and then going out and flying without a license? And do we write up basically a complaint and push that through our contacts with the safety side of the FAA, which does an end run around the other department of the FAA that makes all the examiners? So sometimes you don't get what you want if you do an end run around somebody in a bureaucracy. You guys are understanding what I'm trying to say here. So question is, is do we continue trying to push and hope that the budget things get worked out and continue with the normal processes, or do we attempt to call someone's mom and get them in trouble and, and force it through as a safety issue? So we're pondering that right now. 
this isn't the place to discuss it, but we are looking for membership input on, on uh, what we think we want to do. Yes, Paul. Is there any possibility of, of encouraging existing uh, DPEs and helicopter to add on general? I, I definitely see the rationale with that. I'm not familiar with the process. Certainly worth looking into. Yes, guys. Um, I don't have the numbers now, but it's many thousands of dollars. What was the question? We're trying to raise thousands of dollars. Well, we don't necessarily have to pay give them a free ride, but we can soften the financial flow. Trying to make it more attractive, not necessarily a free ride. But it'd be nice if we got enough money to make it a free ride too, because that would make it even more attractive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We hope so. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's a little more to it than that. I mean, it's you also need to get fired as an engineer, and the FAA wants to make sure that they get fired for a certain period of time, and that they're training a certain number of hours. So they, they pre qualify the application, and there's a little more, it's a little more involved than, than that. So it starts weeding out and making it a little more complex to kind of qualify people on multiple levels. But we do have some people in the Jack and CFIs that are that do meet those. And I believe you do. And I'm right now, I'm not sure what they want. And I'm not sure if they only need to do more. One thing that happened that it helps is to, uh, is when the CFI has a student ready for a check ride, and you go to your kids on and ask for that check ride. They, they, if, they don't, if you don't ever ask, and instead you arrange it with some other yeah, yeah, they don't see the request coming in. Yeah, it is a paperwork machine. And if you generate paperwork, you can attract the attention of the Request a, uh, from your local physical for every sport pilot or pilot and check right at the It's a good point. We need to communicate. Okay. All right, the PRA um, applied for and was accepted into the Alliance for Aviation Across America. Uh, as you can read here, it's a uh, nonprofit, nonpartisan coalition of uh, FBOs, small airports, elected officials, and other organizations and businesses trying to raise awareness about the value of general aviation in local airports. Um, they uh, give several things that help us out greatly. One, as you know, the PRA has an airport here now. Um, so protecting this airport from undue problems and uh, legislation uh, is one thing, and the Alliance across uh, 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 accreditation across America has something that we don't, and that's lobbyists. And so, if we have a voice with them, we might not be able to form our own lobbyists, but we do have, we are now part of a large organization that, that does have some uh, some people uh, in uh, speaking to the uh, uh, government. Uh, in addition to that, we're working. Uh, it's, it's, it's better stronger together than apart. We have common interests with many of these organizations. They are interested in safety, they're interested in protecting our rights. And also, uh, one of their big things that's very helpful with us is they put numbers, financial numbers, to how much small aviation does for communities financially and for emergencies and, and the other things that a small airport and, and the line aviation can do. Uh, for the, the uh, uh, budget, and uh, small governments, and state government, county governments, and they collect all those numbers, they publish those numbers in a, in a, in a uh, uh, format that's easy for non-technical people to read and understand, and they promote that. So having a being part of this is, uh, is quite helpful. Uh, digital archives. Um, the, uh, we've collected uh, quite a bit of digital information over the years. Uh, maybe a bit scanned it with some of the, the automated scanning uh, devices. Uh, thousands of pages of old chapter newsletters going back to the 60s, and sometimes even the 50s, and, uh, as well as uh, videos and other documents. And they're all completely free for the public to download. And that is the uh, PRA Digital Archives, over 11,000 files. Members only videos. This is a short list, and after this convention, if uh, our videos turn out, we'll have some more. 
Um, and we have uh, a video by the most experienced um, medical examiner uh, in the country that, uh, that uh, gave a seminar to the PRA, an online seminar which we recorded from PRA members on how to maintain your FAA medical and how to use the new Med Express system, which is now required for anyone renewing their medical. And it's a very informative and helpful uh, video. And uh, uh, every time that uh, I have any medical questions, and certainly when I go to renew mine, um, I'm going to be going through and watching that again to make sure that I answer the questions the, the, the safest and best way for that system. Um, Passing the job playing check mark video from Rob Menzi. Engine leak down testing. If you're not familiar with what a leak down test is and why it's better than a compression test, you should watch that video. Triple hang test that was recorded at defensive days um, on how to do a, a gyro triple hang test. Radio use of traffic pattern. That was in the uh, uh, recorded version of the seminar that we had here two years ago. Uh, light sword altimetry. Um, if you're not familiar with the, the concept, um, most of the materials of training and testing materials on, on altimeters um, are made for aircraft that routinely fly at 10,000 feet and not for aircraft that are more interested in AGL than MSL like we are. So this video talks about us, people that care about flying close to the ground, uh, not close to the class A airspace. Uh, and then we have lots of recorded convention forms, and then our videos turn out for this convention. Lots more of the recorded convention forms uh, that you can all watch as members. We also have the Manufacturer's Directory and Database. Uh, the popular but labor-intensive uh, issue of Rotograph Magazine uh, has been the Manufacturer's Directory. And uh, with our sport, uh, in particular, it can be hard to source materials for our, our, our helicopters and like rotorcraft to be aware of, of who to contact, who's business, and what the kits are, and what the kits aren't. So the um, last one that was uh, published was way back in 2006. Uh, even though it's the most, it was always the most popular issue that was published, it's extremely labor intensive to be calling all these people up, making sure that they, they're still in business and they've got their prices and their specs right and, and everything else. It takes hours and hours of work to do that. Well, instead of having to redo that every year, what we did this year is uh, we uh, bought a cloud hosted uh, SharePoint uh, database in which we put all that information. Yeah, basically, you're familiar with the new computer term in the cloud and then ported that into the PRA members only website. So you can go into the website, and I don't have internet access in here, so I can't show you too much of this. But here it is. You can go into this website, go into kits, you can sort by company name, name of the uh, 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 kit or the product, uh, number of seats, um, the uh, look at the product photos, the price. We scroll down, we have all kinds of different gear. And you can go into this database and mix and match what you're interested in, compare products. And uh, this uh, uh, database is then being kept up to date as we get information uh, from the vendors. And then once a year, we'll attempt to go out and contact these vendors and push to get this information updated. And then this is used to create the manufacturer's issue of Rotorcraft, which hopefully right now will be a yearly issue um, uh, published. Any questions about the manufacturer's directory before we move on? That's a very exciting. Kit claims follows up on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if, if you have the manufacturer's Contact kit planes, they'll get the information, and then just when it comes out, copy it. Yeah, um, the, we actually hold ourselves to higher standards than, than all the other publications. For you to have a, a uh, aircraft in out at the PRA directory, you have to show us a proof of a flying example. So I don't know if you guys, I'm not going to name any names, but there's several other directories. There's one in the PRA office right now, and you can pick that up. And I see the whole page of, of kits that were for sale with prices, and they don't have a flying model. So we don't do that in, in 
our directory, we make sure that each of the manufacturers proves that they have at least one flying model of, uh, of that aircraft before they go into the manufacturer's directory. And uh, there's been a lot of people that have lost money because they thought something was good to go and then they send off their life savings and then the kit comes and no one's really ever finished one and it's got problems and the company folds and they don't get support. So we're trying to avoid that by really trying to like, have a higher standard for our efforts like the creation. Correct. All right, the DRA EZ, the Road Required Magazine. Um, now, nice monthly, we've been hitting our uh, monthly target. We did combine two issues, um, but uh, we had an issue yeah, for every month on uh, schedule, color, publication. So, really, the only publication solely for about personal rotorcraft. Uh, free classified ads for PRA members. A lot of people don't realize that. If you have something to sell, it costs you nothing. Replace a large, color, detailed ad in rotorcraft for anything that you want to sell, rotorcraft or aviation or anything in the classifies. Um, and also the paper digest available for additional fee. The PRA e-alert um, is a system set up um, uh, by Paul Plack. And um, this is free to the public. And it is an amazingly effective communication mechanism uh, for contacting personal rotorcraft pilots and enthusiasts. Um, so just sort of as an example, um, we did a couple of tests when we were announcing the ground school and announcing a couple of other different uh, products and events. And we first announced them in other media. So some of you may be aware of the Rotary Forum. We ran banner ads at the top for three months on the Rotary Forum, announced it in threads on the Rotary Forum, and took a look at how many people responded from that. Uh, we then uh, had uh, ads and press releases that were published in other magazines, uh, like uh, Powered Sport Flying and some of the other outlets, and then we saw how many responses we got back from that. And then we sent the same information written out the same way in an e-alert, and we had 80% more responses than the other media outlets combined. So if you're familiar with the online forums, they're fantastic for answering the question. But most people only see the hot topic of the day. And if you go to research information with the search function, you have to be fairly computer fluent and rather diligent to be able to read through 50 opinions from different people. The e-alert is, is targeted and it comes to people's mailboxes and their email and they can opt out if they don't want it. And it's been an amazingly successful uh, project. Yay, Paul. Yes. <laughs> Um, closely related, also amazingly successful, is the PRA chapter grant. It covers the activity now of 11 chapters, is that correct? Yes. Of 11 chapters, free to the public, stimulates chapter growth and cooperation, and is part of the e alert system as well. So if you're getting the chapter grant with your e alert, you get a bunch of chapter newsletters all delivered to you in your email box. Uh, for you to read, and it's been a uh, uh, an obvious success. Tim? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to make a point while we're here. Uh, I, I was afraid there might be some misunderstanding about how this works because the, the two that we're distributing on a regular basis are, are, are oddities. Um, several years ago, it occurred to me that if you have a, a local chapter, recruiting a newsletter editor is harder than finding a president. Yeah, yeah. And so when I saw that, a lot of chapters are trying to do a newsletter each month, even on months when they had nothing to put in it. Um, our chapter two newsletter in Utah, uh, I was editing it at the time. Chapter 73 was losing their editor. And I, I know those guys. I was president of their chapter once. And so I, I called them up. I said, hey, what if we can try combining them? So that we did that as a test. And it very quickly grew to six chapters. So that's a regional newsletter. And now there's Southwest Rotorcraft that does the same for Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas. These come out. They look. They look like a magazine. They have a oh, full. Very professional. They, well, no, I'm not yeah. looking for that. But they have a full cover, and, and they look. 
I, I don't want them to be intimidating because we're looking for every individual chapter newsletter too. If your chapter publishes a newsletter and can get it in PDF form and get it to me, we get it to about 3,500 people now. And you may say, well, well, who cares what my local chapter's doing? Well, the chapters that are participating in the regional newsletters are getting people showing up at their meetings who found out about it for, for the first time that they were there through the national distribution. Chapter 73 got a couple of new, three new members one month because people who lived a few miles from Sportcopter had no idea there was a chapter meeting there for all these years. Wow. So get your chapter news around the country and uh, even if it's just your local newsletter, if you can get it to me in PDF form, we'll put it in the distribution. Hey, Paul. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so those are the programs. That's what we've been doing lately. That's what the PRA has been up to. And please let the people know. Uh, so now we've got some uh, uh, infrastructure uh, information. Um, PRA membership numbers are approximately 1,100 members. Yield and subscribers approximately uh, 3,500 plus. And PRA Facebook followers actually it's almost 680 because the convention picture is being posted to events Maybe slide. So that's what the membership numbers are looking at. They've been basically fluctuating and holding steady about those numbers for a while. Um, did you want to add anything to that? Or? Well, I'll add it to it. Okay, well, we'll yeah. add it just a moment. Uh, for those of you that are not aware of what we published uh, on the uh, PRA website, the uh, dance part of the financial factors. So you can actually look back to Dan Farnley uh, on the website. Uh, those of you that did, haven't seen that or unaware, in the uh, close of 2012, the PRA uh, had net income of $2,745. Uh, we, the uh, that went more than that. Yeah, more stronger than that. The membership number obviously can grow. We all know that. Well, uh, as I recall, the membership at one time was around almost 6,000. So we went, and he also put an interesting fact up there how many members are on the ELA as compared to the number of people that are members of the RA. And uh, it would be nice if a good start to them to tell them that. But for whatever reason, the, the numbers seem to have stabilized around 1,100 for like. Uh, Cash perspective, uh, before the beginning of this convention, which is basically the 731 uh, 2013, we had $14,551 in bank. The previous year, we had 13000 so that's up a little bit. That's a good thing. Uh, the convention last year was a little bit bigger than it's going to be this year. I think all of you are aware of that. Uh, so hopefully, we'll generate money from the convention that will help us during the year. But uh, we, if you compare those two years to the years leading up to that for about three or four years previous to that, I would come to the convention with no cash. And, and uh, we would, in fact, have to borrow the money from uh, the Air Force. And of course, I'd reimburse that out of the convention just to get as fun as you go. So we made uh, a lot of uh, strides financial perspective and stabilize the PRA. And uh, the last couple of years we've done a lot better than we did in the previous year. But we we, uh, we need to uh, be cognizant of our membership, encourage people to join the PRA, and encourage people to come to the convention. That, that's one of the major issues for funding the efforts of the PRA. And hopefully we'll get if that happens and we we'll start growing with a lot of these other programs. <coughs> Like to see uh, in operation the tackle from the financial perspective. Your gross income will go up or is our expenses going Our expenses will pay. You know, I know there's always a question about promoting your industry to begin with. But you know, if you look at the internet and how much information is being provided to the public free without joining PRA, are we losing members? Because there's no reason to join when you get most of the information 
Uh, but help me with it. No, actually. Well, I would, my thought process on this is not necessarily the board's, but my on that process. We were, when we first started the heat, so I think the, the DMR system, it was open to the public. The minute bike was in the Well, I believe it was last year we voted to restrict that to the members only. And if you really examine our websites, you'll find huge amounts of information that you can only get to that event. Including now the heat sink. So we restricted that part by sun and sun. And we, we, we uh, uh, realized that what you're describing was occurring. So we made an effort to rescind that somewhat. And I hope this would come to that. Hopefully those people, and I think we had a good kick up in the when we first stopped that. We had a lot of grumbling because they were getting spread. And, and we restricted that somewhat. And I, I think that will have a better financial result as a result of that. However, we do, the internet is the strongest way, in my opinion, that we can track particularly new pilots, young pilots, and the computer side. I pull people all the time at the website, because they don't have the website, and they'll discover that by joining, there's a huge bit of things that underlie our website. And one of, one of the major ones, in my opinion, is all the no follow up around here yet or not, but a good number of our five pack old magazines are there. And people used to go up and buy packages, packages of old magazines. Of course, we financially rescinded our numbers, membership numbers, so that we had to go to a last five magazine. We could no longer afford a green magazine. Now, there's a lot of groundwork about that, particularly the old members that were used to that magazine. But it was just financially impossible to continue in that bank. And in my opinion, the more aggressive we get with the website and the most of it, the more attractive it is that it may draw people in this industry. And I'm hoping that it start buying a lot of harder than it is at present. Robert, I think one of the issues that the PRA has uh, discussed in the past is getting miles to join the PRA, but we've also got a number of services and federal things that are chapter members. Area chapter members that don't belong to the PRA National. Yeah, I, I, and I know that's been addressed in the board of test, but I'm not sure <coughs> that uh, that has really been resolved. We talked about growing members to the National PRA. But yeah, we have these enthusiasts belonging to the local chapter. There's only you know three or five members within that chapter of the national board. Do you want to talk about it? Okay, there's two topics recently in the play. Um, the, almost every major organization on the planet is having to retool and rethink their structure on how to deal with the amount of information that's free on the internet and how it affects the class of clubs and organizations. Many, many of them have already failed and gotten away. So I don't know if any of you are driven by a bookstore that's still open, but uh, if you haven't noticed, you know, the printed media and traditional medias, many traditional clubs um, have not been able to change at all and adapt and have ceased to exist. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to look to models instead of trying to guess and hope we make the right guess. We're trying to look to other people's models that have been successful to see if it's something that we can adapt to what we're doing. So one of these models that were that is successful that we want to see if it can be successful for us. Is there anyone here that's a member of the RotexOwners.com? One, two, three, four. These four of you. How much does it cost to get here? Twenty-nine dollars. Yeah. And uh, what do you get out of it? You get video. One of the things you get those videos. That yeah. You get how-to videos. So you get real good quality information you can't get free anywhere else on the internet, and you get free alerts. Well, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a library of members-only videos with quality information and free alerts. So it's not the only model we're working on, but that's the kind of thing that we're trying to learn from and adapt to to be able to uh, survive and become a modern organization where the internet is not killing us, the internet is taking us from. Uh, for the, the second topic, 
um, the issue of PRA chapters that don't have PRA members, which is a bizarre but strange situation that we find ourselves in. Um, again, we're, uh, and I speak only for myself, not for the rest of the board. Uh, for myself, I am very shy of any cookie cutter solution that uh, will work for one chapter is going to work for the other chapters. There's huge differences in experience, morale, and age from different chapters. Um, what you get with talking with one of the new chapters versus a chapter that's been around for a while versus a chapter that's in the Midwest versus a chapter that's not is they're just like day difference and, and, the, and the kind of people and what they do and, and what they value and what they do and have as, as a chapter. So in my personal opinion, um, I'm very shy of a cookie cutter kind of solution. One thing, again, we're trying to look at other organizations that are having successful chapters to see what they're doing, think it's going to work for us. Uh, I'm an amateur astronomer, and amateur astronomers are suffering basically the same symptoms that the pilot groups are, is that the number of people retiring out of the hobby exceeds by three times the number of new people coming into the hobby. Does that sound familiar? One of the things that some of the successful ones are doing is not pushing down from the national organization on the chapters on what they should be doing and laying down the law, having members and stuff like that. What they're doing is actually taking and basically having one chapter come up with a good idea and having them challenge the other chapters to also implement that good idea. Getting the chapters to grow the other chapters. And if we can adapt a model like that, at least for a while, and see if it works, uh, that's something that uh, I hope to, to explore in the next year. Does that answer your question? Not really, because you say growing the chapter's uh, numbers doesn't grow the PRA at 1,100 number. I'm just saying, EAA, I was a member of EAA for 20 years, I'm no longer. But if we're growing the chapter, you have to be a member of EAA. We're going to remember EAA, so that's a bad model. You're not an EAA member, so. Yeah. yeah. But I can't belong to a chapter, I can't belong to my local, local chapter of yeah. EAA. Are you a member of a local chapter now? Not of EAA, but you can. That's the rules. Yeah. So, 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 they, they, so, they, so we know that model isn't working. No, that's not true. Or it didn't work for you. No. Okay. If I can drop you to one of my local EAA chapter without having to miss $40 in every year, if that were an option for me and I'm a cheap state, why wouldn't I take that? Mm -hmm. But if you say, I'm going to try say from the perspective of someone who's in a chapter organization uh, officer, we will always encourage people who are not members of our chapter to come to our chapter. And since they can come to our meetings and activities without being a member, and we don't really have any kind of carrot like that to dangle that says you can't have this if you're not a member, you, you're kind of asking your your chapters to fall on their sword if you if you make that a, a, requ a hard requirement. Uh, I think EAA chapters have a little bit of an advantage because a lot of them have, a lot more of them, in my opinion, have, uh, you know, chapter tools available and, and a lot of other things that, uh, you know, th they're larger groups, they often have established meeting places with infrastructure and that sort of thing. A lot of our, ch our chapters do not have that. So, uh, do you want to say anything about the, the dues percentage program? Well, that, thank you for reminding me about that. Um, another one of the best kept secrets is that if a chapter brings on a new PRA member, we give you half of their dues back. 
the chapters. So the chapters we made money off of getting new members. We gave you half of the news back. We get a member that's that's uh, not current and they renew, we'll give you a percentage of their news back for talking them into renewing. So we now have in place a way that your chapter can make funds and, and, uh, and finance themselves by bringing in members as an incentive, both renewing members that are relaxed and, uh, and brand new members. So, I, I would encourage the chapter off particularly to, to promote what the PRA is because we're a lot stronger in numbers than we are as individual chapters. The, 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 what the PRA is trying to do, they, they use desperate and they support the chapter. Specific roles that we have a, 
a very um, significant need for. And uh, if anyone here is interested in knowing what it might be, please contact us right away. But uh, before we get to this uh, final topic, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Doug and uh, he wanted to share some information. Uh, two topics, uh, one, the PAC, and two, the elections uh, for the uh, uh, Board of uh, Directors of the PRA. Okay, let me start by saying the PAC, the PRA Advisory Committee, met here a couple hours ago. And they are, uh, if you're not familiar with what the organization is, it was basically taken from a life member organization that seemed to have kind of lost steam and wasn't doing anything, it was kind of going away, and we felt like, you know, there's a lot of experience and there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of help available within this group that we're totally just kind of losing and not taking advantage of. So we restructured the organization, we named it the PAC, and they basically are a uh, subset of PRA. They have their own bylaws, their own organization, their own leadership, and they're tasked with trying to give guidance and help to the board to make sure that the PRA board is on the right track as we're well guiding this organization. Uh, Mark Shook is the current president of that organization. He wasn't able to be here at this meeting, so he asked me to um, share some information with you. The way the PAC is set up, everyone that was a life member is automatically in that organization. And all, all of them uh, have a desire to be active and be involved, but I believe they have about 50 people from that life organization that are on their books. And they gave everyone an option to say, yes, I want to be active, or no, I just want to kind of sit back here and do my own thing. And I think they have about 20 or 25 people on that group that said, yes, we'd like to be active. Now, unfortunately, not every one of those are stepping up and actively involved. They said they'd like to, but they're not necessarily finding the time to do it. And so one of the things we did was we created a way to add new members to that. Because that group we can't become a life member anymore. We knew we needed to have people joining that group or that group's going to die too. So members can be uh, appointed to that group from the PRA board. They also can be recruited from within the PAC. And so they have gone out and they have asked some people to join their organization. Some of them said, you know what, I'm so busy, I just can't. And some of them have accepted and said, yes, I will. But that recruiting and, and the numbers that they have to work with are not adequate to meet the workflow that they feel like they have right now. So they want to expand and broaden the scope of who can be a part of that group. And you know, our first our thought was, we ought to be looking for people who have got years and years and or craft got a lot of experience and wisdom that they can share with the rest of the group. At this point, they're saying, you know what, maybe it's okay if they don't have years and years of experience, they have some experience. They have some knowledge or skills or value that they can bring to the group, but most importantly, they have a desire. They want to be involved in health and they're willing to, to get active with something. This is not a, a good old boys organization. It's not something you get in so you can say, yeah, I'm a PAC member, and we don't care about that. We care about people that want to be actively involved in helping direct the organization. Right now, one of the projects they're working on is looking at the bylaws for the organization and trying to update them and make them more critical to what we're going And that's been a pretty big job, and they need to work out. So, at this meeting, we would like to, uh, to, to announce the membership that anyone who would like to self-nominate itself can. You no longer have to be invited by someone who's already a member of the PAC. Anyone that has a desire and willingness to be involved needs to contact Mark Shook. Paul? You should probably tell them what's involved in being a member, the commitment. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a member of that organization, so I don't, I haven't read the bylaws and I don't know exactly, but I don't think they have a bunch of strict rules on how, how often they have to be there. I think they are trying to do a meeting quarterly, so once every three months. But it's online, primarily. Yeah, it's online, so it's not something you have to be there in person. And they're looking for people that can contribute on the forum, that you know, can read 
you know, they, they start a thread and they're working on stuff and they want people to just go on the forum and read it and comment back. Do I like this? Is it far enough? Is it not far enough? They're just looking for participation. So the guideline is not so much a minimum commitment to requiring other than you got to do something. We just want people that are willing to be involved and participate and help lead the organization. It's a great opportunity for anyone. And, and at this point, I think we need to have a direction in our organization that we really need to be recruiting some younger people. If you look around, you know, this room, we're getting older and older, and that's a challenge. And we really need some young people. Of your blood, some newer, excited people that are willing to be a part of it. So that's something they've asked for. They really would like to hear from you if you have any desire or willingness at all to serve and be a part of that organization. It's a great opportunity to, to work with some really powerful people, people that have, that have made this organization and, and participated in history here. So it's a great opportunity. I encourage you to to think a little bit about it. I, I promise you, I understand everybody is busy. And probably everyone in this room feels like, you know what, I've got so much going on right now, I can't take one more thing. I did that, I feel that way. And yet, every one of us is capable of doing more than what we do. And someone's got to do it. So I'm asking you, I'm asking you to think about it yourself. I'm asking you to go back to your chapter and think about people in your chapters that could or would and talk to them about it. And let's try to recruit some new members to that organization and really get it effective, making a difference. That was well done, Doug. Thank you. That's getting out of yourself, man, getting excited is the way to go. Okay, topic number two. I was asked to be the election committee chairman for the election this year. And folks are all in and tally and we have an announcement on who the new four board members are that were elected this year. And we'll do this from those who receive the highest percentage of votes down. Top, um, top winner was Robert Weimer with 90.9%. Yeah.
uh, are kicked out of airports because the local airport manager becomes unfriendly or a different manager comes in to light sport aircraft. And places where people have held meetings or chapters or conventions for light sport aircraft basically get kicked out because they're not welcome. And when I tell them that we have a light sport or ultra light friendly airport, they're like, wow, that's great for as long as it lasts. I said, oh, it's gonna last me all the airport. It's amazing. It's old hat to PRA members, but to other aviation organizations, we have an asset that's just amazing to them. And, uh, and, and, and it's something very important. But we need to be able to leverage that asset. So we've already started doing this, but we simply don't have the volunteer time and manpower to do it. And if we can get someone who can take on this kind of role, uh, they hopefully and certainly seems uh, possible they can make it into a full-time job for themselves uh, should they wish to do that or grow to a certain point and then hire it off to someone by having job interviews where we will be able to pay someone to do this. Uh, Jane, uh, can you tell me um, uh, how many camping groups we have? We have three camping groups that rent this air or not to fly stuff here, just to camp. We have a fireworks club that uses this airport for fireworks. So it doesn't have to be aviators. People can use the airport for camping, for events, and motorcycle shows, and bar shows, and all kinds of other things where these facilities with a shower and, and vendor areas and power spots and camping and RV spots and an office and Wi-Fi and these other facilities we only use two weeks out of the year are of great help and an asset to these other clubs that will generate revenue to both improve and upkeep the airport as well as sponsor some of these programs that really would change and influence our sport. So if you or someone you know would be able to step into the position or even a group of people, even a group of people step into the position of coming in to manage and promote this airport, um, that would be something that we really need to do. We started to take some steps, but frankly, we've been overwhelmed with the volunteers that we have in the work. We had intended to run a large ad in, in uh, some of the aviation magazines and some of the camping magazines advertising Benton Airport, but we simply ran out of time, uh, and we haven't done that yet. And really, it's pretty late in the season. People already have planned their locations for next year already. So the, the, this sort of thing could, has a cycle of about a year and a half ahead of time. So even if we start right now, we're still a year and a half out before we can really start this, this growing. We've also had to turn down several large lucrative events because we don't have some of the power supplies in some of the camping areas that some of these larger groups want. We've had a couple of opportunities where we could have had conventions larger than the PRA convention here, but we're just short on the funds to make that extra little bit of infrastructure. So we've uh, made a few steps. Um, in this direction to uh, do what we can with the volunteers that we have. And so here's the Vento Airport uh, website. Uh, it's pretty basic, but it's better than a 404 air. And, uh, sorry, very cute for those of you that are uh, So we have an example map, airport facilities. Uh, we have a fireworks club that we work closely with. If someone holds an event here, don't give a fireworks show for them. We can arrange that. How is that as a benefit that some other places won't have for them? So um, the Minnesota Airport uh, could be something that uh, could turn into to something that light sport aviation could benefit from really dramatically. How much of that air, uh, area is owned by PRA for the airport? Is there a future issue with encroachment, houses, or anything coming within the airport of Europe? Uh, well, right now, I think I'm going to fly for half an hour before I get to any kind of potential encroachment. But I suppose that the human race keeps growing, it's eventually. It looks like we, I don't know, you can put around here. Same farmer, yeah. the normal size, and the ones that are Is this 
personal term management process. We are, we are open to any offer. Someone approaches us and say, hey, I'll manage your events in your airports and I'll take half of it and give you half of it. We'll bring it before the board. Uh, at this point, we're, we're open to, to anyone who wants to approach us with an offer. Good question. All right. Any other questions on this topic? Yes. Is, is it written anywhere on the website where what we have to offer here as far as electricity, water, square footage? On the on the Benton Airport website, we don't have a lot of technical details on that, and we would love to. We just simply haven't had someone sit down with enough time to plug all that in. We could use that. That would be important. Yeah. The other thing is, if you had a manager, let's say, like you're looking for an event manager, airport manager, What's the likelihood they could live in the uh, trailer? Um, if for the right person. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I can't speak for the board, but um, doesn't seem unreasonable to me. The only you know, thing is, uh, status of that house? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I keep in mind. There's some, some investigation on that uh, recently? Yeah, yeah I mean, we are really open to, to anything yeah. that, that is a win win. If it's a win win situation, we're probably going to say yes. Because someone would probably have to move into this area. And yeah. no better place than on the airport if they're going to be here managing and running it. Yeah, and that, that certainly would be ideal. But, you know, technically speaking, um, I think we could even have someone who doesn't even live in the state do the job. In the modern day of, of, uh, of uh, you know, some of these different event arrangements and stuff like that, um, it certainly uh, could be possible uh, for someone who doesn't live here to do that. You know, there's certainly some significant advantages though, absolutely. So, you know, I'll, you probably can't read the text from, from back uh, even where I'm standing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there, there, we do have a small blur on, on what the airport That's is. That's where they need to expand the time. Oh, yeah. Acreage, room, you know, uh, uh, expand it, testimonials, pictures of the. We have an air conditioned classroom here. You know, there are facilities that when I talk to some of these groups, they're just blown away that we use it for a week or two a year, and, and uh, they find that amazing. Again, uh, we're, we're the club of well kept secrets almost more than we are a personal loader for them. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've got, we do have a, a map of the, uh, of the airport layout for the conventions uh, on here, but it is, it is really just a very minimal web space. So this kind of gives an idea if someone has a convention here, what kind of facilities uh, would be available using our own convention as an example. Okay, uh, very quickly just to wrap up. Uh, the next thing we need is a media manager and promoter. Uh, we had a discussion earlier, so I'm not going to rehash that. Uh, the Rotex Owners.com model, if you get some quality information on the internet, people will pay to subscribe to that information. So we really need a volunteer to go out there and encourage people to basically make and donate videos with exclusive use of the PRA to put in our library so that people will subscribe to this, this high quality information or even people just to help other people make videos that say, I have some knowledge I'd like to share, but I don't know the front end of the camera from the back end of the camera. So if you can help in any way or know someone that does, let us know. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be video. Uh, we have free quizzes on the website that are taken over a hundred times a month by people that educate people on light sport and rotorcraft by going through fun series of quizzes. And that, that is helpful as well. It draws people to the site and keeps them there long enough that they learn about our sport. Um, Dr. Charnoff uh, donated to the PRA a printed out, it's about that thick history of the PRA. Um, and um, we uh, need to uh, find out how to copyright that and decide how to share that properly with the membership. We don't really have a volunteer in charge of that, and we're looking for someone to do that. Now, uh, also, uh, for a number of years in the past, a PRA incident response team list was made. Knowledgeable people about light sport rotorcraft that, when asked, could assist the NTSB, FAA, or other law enforcement or uh, first responder agencies, or second and third responder agencies, in the event of a light sport rotorcraft uh, accident. Um, it was a very good program, and it was utilized. 
Um, but the person who was running the list got a different job and moved on and didn't maintain the list. We don't currently have a volunteer to do that. So your, the, the job of the volunteer would simply be maintaining a list of, of knowledgeable people at different regions of the com uh, country and make that list available to the NTSB and, and other agencies. So if, if they want some basically local expert help in the event of, a, of an incident or a crash or if they just have, have questions uh, about safety or, or guidance, that they can contact someone in their region. So we have a kind of growing out of date list of this to build off of, and we'd like to have a volunteer continue that as a, as a membership and, and support benefit. Okay, so any questions on anything? Yes. Uh, are these um, manager uh, positions that you're trying to fill? Is there a list of them that you're looking um, we publish them um, uh, in the um, e-alert and the um, uh, 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 EC. Um, and this presentation is on something that turns out will we'll be available to everyone publicly. Yeah, yeah see, it's also, uh, Mike's also put in the last couple issues of Southwest Rotor Grab, which oh, has gone out. Yes, that's right. Very good. Thank you for reminding me. And it also has been uh, in, the, uh, in the chat here. All right, additional questions? I would like to thank everyone for being a few right number and coming to this meeting. And so thank you for coming to the convention. I hope you have a great time.